Hello guys, welcome back to another installment of the Mountainside Apologetics series. Going to take a little bit of a turn off the philosophical road and look intensely at a scriptural topic today. Scripture and apologetics have this serious overlap in the realm of prophecy. So that's what we're going to dive into. Prophecy. What is it? Is it legitimate? Are they seriously told before the events What can we know from the Bible about God's existence through prophecy? How can we make a demonstration to those who don't believe through prophecy? This is not something I often see done in apologetic circles. And I think apologists can do a little bit better to point out the legitimacy of the foretelling events that are penned in Scripture. So what is prophecy? Well, prophecy comes from... A prefix in a Greek word it means to say in advance or possibly to speak forth. Sometimes these days we hear prophecy as just being well, anybody speaking something from the Lord is prophesying. And that's true to an extent, but specifically by the word prophecy. And as we are going to look at it here, we're going to primarily focus on the foretelling nature of the things that God speaks. The other branch of this would be something that I talked about on the podcast last week. The divine insights that are contained in the Bible. So one divine insight is being able to tell future events. Another divine insight would be telling, say, scientific events or telling of things that are going on in other places or in other people that one could not naturally know. Those are all prophetic in nature, but it's hard to test the nature of the inspiration of those events from thousands of years ago. But if we can find definitive proof that events were told hundreds or maybe thousands of years before they came to pass, then we have an element of proof that we can then use to show people. To show people the existence of God, the legitimacy of scripture, and the purpose of God's message. Because we need to remember when we're looking at prophecy, we're not just wowing ourselves. We're not just having God blow our minds with magic tricks. No, he's doing something through it. He's presenting a message through it. There's a reason that he is saying these things in advance, and it's more than just to put on a show. And that's always the case with miracles, with scripture, and with what God communicates. So the term prophet is used frequently in the Bible, obviously. It's a huge portion of the writings of the Bible. I saw a stat that I had written several years ago that said there were 2,500 prophecies in the Bible and about 2,000 of them have come to pass. Different people have different estimates on the number of prophecies, depending on how you count prophecies. And sometimes it's a little hard to tell exactly what's a prophecy and what's not. So... I'll present a bunch, though, that that should make a definitive case that there are many prophecies that have come to pass. Now, a prophet was a person called by God in the Old Testament, and these prophets, according to Jesus, ended with John the Baptist. I had listed 23 of them. Uh, I know there are more. Abraham was called a prophet. He was the first one that was called a prophet back in... uh, I think around Genesis 20, and then several others, and then 23 specific prophets who had a large influence and and communicated things that are recorded in Scripture. Prophets are mentioned 486 times total in the Bible, including 162 times in the New Testament. And of course, with the office of prophet ending with John the Baptist, a lot of these 162 uses are referring to the prophets of the Old Testament because what they have said was coming to pass. The first mention of the act of prophecy is in Numbers 11, where there's an an accompaniment of 70 elders around Moses, and there's this one-time occurrence of the Holy Spirit coming over them, and they begin to prophesy. Interesting. Prophets were required to speak from God, and only what God was saying, not adding to it. If someone's called to this office, that is a very serious calling, not to be taken lightly, and not to be done flippantly. I wonder how modern preaching might change 
if there was that same urgency to only speak what God is communicating. This is laid out in Deuteronomy 18. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. You may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. The office of prophet was so serious that one could be killed for speaking presumptuously. They would not make prophecies flippantly or just throw things out there. Now, I know in Jeremiah's time, yes, they are pretty flippant about the prophecies they make. They're trying to be welcoming to the people. They're trying to just cheer up the people and not actually speak the truth. So this office of prophet lasts until just before the time of Christ with John the Baptist. This is affirmed by Jesus himself in Matthew eleven thirteen, And then it's affirmed by the author of Hebrews, who said that God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets, and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he's spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world. Now, prophecy, fascinating topic in the Bible. Some people apply prophecy to just end times things, and they go completely off in that direction, and they forget about the bulk of prophecy, the original prophecy, and the purpose that that had in the scripture. But I think there's an apologetic value to prophecy. There are a few tests to Yahweh-centric faith throughout the Old Testament period. One, which we've talked about, is the stunning beauty and order of creation. Psalm 19, Job 38 are a couple places that lay this out. Creation needs a creator. Another is the provision, the faithfulness, and the long-term work of God, which is seen in feasts, memorial stones, songs of recollection, and historical recall, such as Nehemiah chapter 9. Within this, miracles were another proof of God. So we have creation, preservation and inter intervention, and communication. Three major tests for the existence of God and the reality of the faith that Yahweh was generating. Creation we've talked about, miracles we've talked about a little bit, and now communication. Has God really spoken? How would we know? And how would we know that man didn't just come up with those words? If God intervenes into creation, he may also intervene into the human mind or the human heart. Evidence for this divine communication happens within this intriguing sphere of prophecy. Prophecy is testable as a sign of God's communication. If there are recorded documents which make claims about upcoming events, and these documents predate the events and predate the time period in which the events could naturally be foretold, this is evidence. Documentation of the fulfillment also needs to be present in some way. So here's my premise to bring in my logic side into this. If there is legitimate foretelling events that could not have been known by humans, then God is the only fitting explanation for the source of these sayings. Obviously then we need to test, are there legitimate foretelling events that could not have been known naturally by humans? If there are, God must exist as the only explanation, the fitting explanation, for the origination of these sayings, of these forecasts. So we'll have to test each prophecy asking, and we won't have time to ask specifically in all these, but keeping in mind, does this foretell something? Is this a legitimate saying? Is this legitimate writing done at the time that it said it was written? Could this have been just naturally known by humans? And are there any alternative explanations? Alternative explanations. We, we think of prophecies of like Nostradamus, or maybe prophecies of other religions. And, and we think, well, what's, what's the test that's keeping those from coming to pass? Well, there are prophecies in the Book of Mormon, but these are non-historical because of the dating of the original writing of the Book of Mormon. There are prophecies by Nostradamus, 
but they're very vague and there's such an abundance of them you have a huge pool to choose from to figure out which vague saying may match some current world event probably not legitimate could they be demonic revelation maybe i tend to think that demonic revelation can only occur with what is going on presently and can't legitimately forecast future events without specifically manipulating future events there is not a foreknowledge in the demons as it is with god could it just be statistical outcomes if you make a hundred predictions the chances that one or two of them come true are pretty good well that may be the case with nostradamus but not in the case of the Bible, where you have a continuous flow of, of Christological prophecy. Could it just be chalked up to self-fulfillment? We see in the New Testament, well, this happens so that it would be fulfilled. There are some you could make that argument with, but there are also a lot of prophecies that could not be explained by self-fulfillment. So, where other faiths with their kind of weak presentation of prophecies even fail. The Bible stands very strong. Now, when we compare other religions and the nature of God possibly inspiring those writings, prophecy is a very interesting place to come to because prophecy is found in the Bible. And the next most popular book, the Koran, prophecy is absent. There are two or three claimed prophecies, but these are all within the lifetime of Muhammad and could either be self-fulfilled or non-historical, written after the fact. Other than that, really forecasting future events is absent from the Quran. It's absent from the writings of Hinduism. It's absent from the writings of Buddhism. It's non-historical in the case of Mormonism. And all other faiths that I know of really avoid the use of foretelling future events unless they're things that they can self-fulfill in the moment. The Bible is extremely unique in this case, and I think the world needs to know that. Okay, let's dive in. This is going to go like rapid fire because there are so many prophecies to get to here. The first is going to be Old Testament prophecies, just, just foretelling major upcoming events. And then we'll get into the prophecies of Psalm 22, the prophecies of Isaiah 53, and then New Testament prophecies, specifically just in the book of Matthew. And by the way, another premise that I have here, and this needs some more testing, is that there are no major biblically weighty events or themes that are not foretold in some way in Scripture. I think that will test true as we just look at some of the more spectacular prophecies in the Old Testament. All right, prophecy begins in Genesis 3.15. Satan's head will be crushed, but this seed of the woman will have a bruised heel. All right, the foretelling of the Messiah, the role of the Messiah to crush the work of Satan. Genesis 5. I didn't write it out specifically. Genesis 5's genealogy is the gospel in a nutshell, just in the names of the generations from Adam through Noah. Okay, Genesis 6, the flood. The flood was foretold before it happened. How in the world would Noah know to build a boat 100 years before the flood occurs? Prophecy. Abraham will have a child. Well, no big deal, right? Well, he's 90 years old, right? Or 100 years old. Not just a child, he's going to have a nation, according to Genesis 15, 4 and 12, 2. Genesis 22, Abraham taking Isaac up the mountain, the promised child, and he says, God himself will provide the lamb. Many parallels to Christ in that chapter. Exodus 3, 8, God promises to free the Hebrews from Egypt and bring them to the promised land. Isaiah 23, there's a temporary destruction of the city of Tyre. Zechariah 9, a complete destruction of Tyre. Her wealth will be cast into the sea and she will be consumed with fire. Ezekiel 26 elaborates, there's going to be bare rock, a place for spreading nets by the sea. The way that this was fulfilled was pretty spectacular. 
Daniel 2, 36-45, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He interprets there's going to be four great empires. Right? This is the statue, the head of gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and the iron mixed with clay. This is the Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by Greece, followed by Rome in about 63 B.C. Isaiah 44:28 and 45:13. This person named Cyrus will free the Hebrews to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. Quote, he will build my city and let my exiles go free. And that's fulfilled in 2 Chronicles 36:22. Jeremiah 25:12 and 29:10. The exile will be 70 years, then Babylon will be overthrown. <laughs> How would they know this? That's fulfilled, 2 Chronicles 36, 21. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Here's the timeline of the coming Messiah, the 70 weeks prophecy. 69 sevens, and then the 70th, and Messiah will be cut off. And what's going on here is it's given at the time of the decree to rebuild the temple, which if we're looking at the Artaxerxes decree, that's 446 BC. And then the 69 sevens, if you convert from 360-day years, which they were counting by, to legitimate 365 and a quarter years, you have this timeline of the Messiah being cut off right at 30 AD. Daniel 9.27, the abomination of desolation and the destruction of the temple. This is thought to be Antiochus Epiphanes in 70 AD. Jerusalem's overthrown, the temple's destroyed. So the Messiah had to come before that destruction of the temple in 70. Isaiah 7.14 foretells the virgin birth of the Messiah, fulfilled in Matthew 1.23. Micah 5.2, the birthplace of the Messiah, right? Bethlehem, city of David, Matthew 2.6 fulfills that. Malachi 3.1, there's a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi 4.5, Elijah, the prophetic forerunner to the Messiah. And Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of one calling in the wilderness. This is fulfilled by John the Baptist in all four Gospels. Matthew 3.3, 3, Mark 1.3, Luke 3.4, and John 1.23. Psalm 146.8, Isaiah 29.18, and 42.7. This Messiah opens the eyes of the blind. And then in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, there's an inner healing, a comfort for the people. This fulfills according to Matthew 9.30 and John 9.7. Psalm 118.22, Messiah is going to be rejected by his own people. The stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And this fulfilled in John 1.11. The crucifixion of the Messiah, obviously fulfilled in all four Gospels. Crucifixion is mentioned in Psalm 22.16. We'll go into more detail later. Zechariah 12.10 and Isaiah 53.5. Specifically, a crucifixion method which was not invented at the time. Psalm 16.10. You will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. The resurrection of the Messiah. This fulfilled according to Acts 13.35. There's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Joel chapter 2. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit fulfilled in Acts 2. Hosea 2.23 and Isaiah 9.2, there's going to be a revival of the Gentiles. I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they will say, you are my God. This a major theme in the New Testament and in the ministry of Jesus, specifically fulfilled according to Luke 2.32 and Acts 10.45. So there you have about every gospel theme and other major events are all being foretold in the Old Testament before coming to pass. Now, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 are two of the most striking prophetic passages in all of human history. Let's look at the number of prophetic claims in each of these. There's actually 36 specific ones that I counted in Isaiah 53 and 22 in Psalm 22. Convenient. All right, Isaiah 53. What does it say? about the coming Christ. Well, he's going to have a marred appearance beyond any man. He's going to silence kings. They're going to comprehend things previously unknown. 
He's unattractive and unmajestic. He's despised and forsaken of men. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He's unesteemed. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. We considered him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. He's chastened for our well-being. We're healed by his scourging. Our iniquities fall on him. He's oppressed. He's silent like a lamb to the slaughter. He's taken away for the purpose of judgment. He's considered dead and gone. He's given a grave with wicked men. He's with a rich man in his death. He did no violence. There was no deceit in him. This pleased the Lord. He became a guilt offering. He will have offspring. He will live on. God will see it and be satisfied. He's going to justify many. He's going to bear their iniquities. He will be rewarded. He will give his life. He was with the transgressors. He will bear sins. And he will stand in the gap for transgressors. Now often you can read this Isaiah 53 to somebody who's less familiar with the Bible and ask, who do you think this is referring to? And even people with very little knowledge of the Christian faith are going to say, well, that's, that's about Jesus. If you ask them when they think that was written, what do you think they would say? They probably wouldn't say 700 years before Christ. But this, in fact, was written 700 years before Christ. Could it have been written after Christ? Absolutely not. <laughs> They're actually quoting the book of Isaiah in the New Testament. Jesus quotes from Isaiah in the New Testament. And then at the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they found copies of the scrolls of Isaiah. Isaiah was the most popular book in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which includes this chapter, specifically laying out the ministry of the Messiah and the type of death that he would suffer. Psalm 22 is another striking place. And this is what Jesus quoted on the cross when he said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some say, oh, Jesus was forsaken by God. There's some mess up in the tr nature of the Trinity that's going on here. No, I don't think so. I think what's going on here is Jesus is quoting Psalm 22 and possibly reciting the entire psalm or possibly referring to the beginning line of the psalm, which is like the title, so that everybody would be aware that what's going on in Psalm 22 needs to come to mind and possibly suggesting the fact that this is being fulfilled before their eyes. Psalm 22, 22 prophecies. The Messiah, he's going to feel forsaken. He cries out frequently. He's a reproach and despised. People sneer and mock. They'll say, let God rescue him if he wants. He has a special designation from birth. Bulls from Bashan surround him. This suggesting... Syria and the Gentiles, and later what would be Rome, surrounded him. They're loud and harsh in their treatment. He feels dehydrated, drained of energy. His bones are out of joint, which makes sense on a cross. His heart feels like it's melting. It's overworked, maybe, or overwhelmed. He's without strength. This is why he needed someone else to carry the cross. He's thirsty. He's surrounded by evildoers. He's buried in the place of dead people. He has pierced hands and feet. He has no broken bones. Miraculously, they pierced his side, seeing that he was already dead, rather than breaking his legs. Okay, onlookers will be there throughout. They tear off sections of clothing and cast lots for it. But the Lord is there to help. The ends of the earth will praise in light of it. Even the dead will acknowledge and worship, suggesting either the afterlife or the fact that some people who appeared to come back to life after the crucifixion in the book of Matthew. Okay, a couple striking passages from the Old Testament that obviously refer to the Messiah 
and have frequent prophecies that seem to be quite specifically fulfilled by him. How do people know to write this in the Old Testament? It's not natural human knowledge. There could be no natural human knowledge of something like a crucifixion. That was not invented for another several hundred years. Alternative explanations fail. Therefore, the foretelling of these events seems to only make sense if one who has a mind of the future is communicating those things to the writers. But the only one that could have such knowledge is God. Okay, how about the book of Matthew? Prophecy doesn't end in the Old Testament. Prophecies are there in the book of Matthew, too. So uh, Matthew has a special emphasis for fulfilling Old Testament prophecies because of the way he's writing to the Jews and trying to show them that Jesus is the Messiah. But also within Matthew, there's prophecies that Jesus makes about himself and some other future prophecies. So in the book of Matthew, I found 48 prophecies. 27 have specific Old Testament prediction fulfillment. Uh, one has an uncertain reference. And about 20 prophecies originate with Jesus. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. The virgin will have child and be called Emmanuel, according to Isaiah 7, 14. Matthew 2, 5. Magi inquire the Messiah's birthplace and they determine it to be Bethlehem, according to Micah 5, 2. Matthew 2.15, Joseph <clears throat> takes the Christ child to Egypt to flee from Herod's infanticide, so that it be fulfilled, out of Egypt I have called my son, according to Hosea 1.1 1, 1 and Numbers 24.8. Two verses later, Matthew 2.17, there's weeping and grief over Herod's slaughter. Rama, Rachel, weeping for her children, according to Jeremiah 31.15. Matthew 2.23, they returned from Egypt and lived in Nazareth. This fulfilled, according to Matthew, reference uncertain, possibly Isaiah 9.1. Matthew 3.3, 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the way for the Lord, according to Isaiah 40, verse 3. Matthew 4.14-16, 4, to 16, Jesus moved to Capernaum. People who were in Zebulon, beyond the Jordan, who were living in darkness, saw a great light. That's a quote from Isaiah 9, 1, and 2. Jesus frees the demon-possessed and heals the sick. Quote, he took our infirmities and took our diseases. Fulfills Isaiah 53, 4 from Matthew eight seventeen. 17. Uh, Matthew twelve seventeen. the Pharisees conspired against Jesus, but Jesus continued to go out healing. Quote, my beloved shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Fulfilling Isaiah 42, 1 and 2. Matthew 12, 40, the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth three days, three nights. That's according to Jonah 1, 17. Matthew 13, 14, parables keep the unfaithful from understanding Jesus. Quote, you'll keep hearing and not understand from Isaiah 6, 9. Matthew 13, 35, Jesus speaks to them in parables. Quote from Psalm 78, 2, I will open my mouth in parables and reveal things that have been hidden since the foundation of the world. Matthew 15, 17, these people, the Pharisees and scribes, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. A quote from Isaiah 29, 13. Matthew 16, 21, in Jerusalem, Jesus will be delivered in the hands of sinners, mocked, scourged, killed, and raised to life on the third day. Matthew 21, 7, Jesus rides into Jerusalem for the final time on a donkey with a colt. That fulfilled from Zechariah 9, 9, your king is coming to you mounted on the donkey. Matthew 24, 2, every stone of the temple will be thrown down. Right? This is Jesus' signs of the end times, which is loaded with several prophecies here. So every stone in the temple will be thrown down, occurring in 70 AD. Matthew 24, 5, there are going to be many who come after who are going to call themselves Christ. We still see that happening. Matthew 24, 6, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. 24, 7, famines and earthquakes. 24, 9, you will be delivered into tribulation. 24, 11, many false prophets will come. 24, 14, 
This gospel will go around the world. 2415, abomination of desolation at the temple. Harkening back to Daniel 1131 and 927. 2421, tribulation like never before. 2424, signs shown by false Christs and false prophets. 2426, there will be false claims of a second coming of Christ, just like the Baha'i faith. 2430, the return of the Son of Man will shock the world. And then after this, just before heading to the cross, Jesus continues to foretell events. 2623, Judas will betray Jesus. In this fulfilling Psalm 41 9, the close friend who ate with me will lift his heel against me. 2629, this is my last meal, my last drink. How did Jesus know that this was the Last Supper? 2631, you will abandon me. Simple phrase, but a bold prediction for people who claim to be his closest friends for a long time. 2632, I will be raised. 2634, Peter would deny Jesus three times that night. That fulfilled in 2675 in Matthew. 2645, I'm about to be delivered into the hands of sinners. 2656, why didn't you arrest me before? Because all this is to fulfill the scriptures and the prophets. He's telling them that you are unknowingly fulfilling the word of God spoken beforehand. 2661 and 2740 says, Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days, predicting a third day resurrection. 2663, Jesus is silent before his accusers, according to Isaiah 53, 7. 2664, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming on the clouds of heaven. That quoting Daniel 7.13. 27.9, he'll be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, a slave price. That specifically fulfills Zechariah 11.13. In the next verse, the 30 pieces of silver would go to buy a potter's field. Also Zechariah 11.13. 27, 26, and 38, Jesus is crucified, which is the nailing of the hands and the feet to the cross. That fulfilling Psalm 22, 16, and Zechariah 12, 10. Matthew 27, 34, and 48, they gave him wine and gall to drink during his torture, fulfilling Psalm 69, 21. Matthew 27, 35, they will divide his clothing and cast lots for it, fulfilling Psalm 28, 18. Matthew 27, 39, and 41, those who see, scoff, mock, and wag their heads at him, fulfilling Psalm 22, 7, and 109, 25. Matthew 27, 43, he trusts in God, let him save him, if he delights in him. That according to Psalm 22, 8. Matthew 27, 45, the light of the Lord is present, darkness covers the earth, before the Lord rises and shines on them again. Isaiah 60, verse 2. Matthew 27, 46. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Psalm 22, 1, right? The Christ will feel abandoned. 27, 51. After the cry for help, the earth shook. Fulfilling Psalm 18, 7. Matthew 27, 57 to 60. He's going to be buried in the tomb of a rich man. Fulfilling Isaiah 53, 9. And Matthew 28, 18, all authority is given to Jesus Christ for glory in the nations of the world, that fulfilling Daniel 7, 14. That's a lot of prophecy, and that is just on the surface of it. Those are the more spectacular ones, and those are the ones that go to show there is nothing really core to the Christian gospel, to Christian history, Christian biblical history, that was not told in advance in the Bible. All these things seem to be told, and God is specifically choosing the things that he would foretell. And why is that? Well, I think John 13, 19 gives a great hint at this. This is where Jesus tells his disciples when he's nearing the time of the end of his life, he said, from now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, 
you may believe that I am he. And this I am he, the he is provided, but the Greek term is ego a me, hearkening back to Exodus 3.14, where God says to Moses, tell them that the I am, the ego a me, has sent you. It's a claim to deity. You may believe that I am he. That's why I'm telling you these things in advance. And this is an echo from Isaiah 46, 9 through 10. Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there was no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God says these things in advance to overthrow the idea that there's possibly some other God that could be communicating these things. And if God has shown himself to communicate these things in advance and shows his knowledge in advance, how would anybody believe anything but the gospel that's presented in the God who actually can foretell the events that are coming in the future? Remember, we don't see prophecy from any other claims of deity. We don't see prophecy like this in any other claimed scriptural writings that supposedly have come from some other God. The Book of Mormon doesn't have it because it's non-historical. The Quran doesn't contain it, and the couple that it does claim to contain are fulfilled within that same general time frame, a self-fulfillment, general prediction kind of thing. Other religious writings don't contain prophecy of this nature, but the historical nature of the Bible, being that the Old Testament is proven to be written long before the time of Christ, 1500 AD in the writings of Moses up through about 400, AD, uh, 400 BC, with Job possibly closer to 2000 BC, these events continually point to the ministry that Christ would have and the fulfillment of God's purposes that Christ would have. And he tells them in advance so that we know that when they occur, we'll be able to recognize, I am he. The I am of the Old Testament, Yahweh God, has spoken these things. And that Jesus Christ, the fulfillment of these things, has come to fulfill and has spoken them and is in very nature God himself. So this gospel is wrapped into these prophecies so that we would know that it's not some naturally contrived, human-oriented type of message, but it's a message that originates with the mind of God. And according to 2 Peter 1.21, where he says that it hasn't come about by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There's no other explanation for this kind of message. People wouldn't even want to come up with this kind of message. It originated in the mind and the plan of God. And that's proven through these prophecies and many more. So there's a little bit on how you can use prophecy in your apologetic. It both shows the existence of God, the legitimacy of Scripture and the inspiration of it, and it shows the message of Christ was set in the mind of God long before the events. There's a lot that you can show about the Christian message through prophecy, and I pray that you and I can use it wisely with skeptics and to encourage believers that this God who has spoken is continually fulfilling his gospel in the hearts of those who believe in him today. So I invite you to come closer to him, uh, believe in the God who's spoken in ages past, and he will speak new life into your heart, I promise. Talk to you soon. May God bless and guide you.